Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Greg Lukianov, attorney, New York Times bestselling author, president and CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, and the author of one of my favorite books, The Codlin of the American Mind. I doubt you'll be able to see it. My eyesight's pretty, <laughs> pretty good to be able to see this. But Greg, welcome to the show. No, thank you so much for having me. Amazing. So I think that this would be... Um, a good way to take this conversation is if we sort of went in chronological order. Mm -hmm. So before we jump into the chronal to the codlin of the American mind, I'd love to start right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, you talk in the book that you had a pretty rough 2007. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, the, I wonder, could you sort of um, share, you know, what happened in that year, your battles with December, uh, with depression, and what your mm -hmm. sort of memories from that year are? Oh, boy. Well, it, it started even earlier. Um, I went to law school specifically to do, be a First Amendment lawyer. I'm kind of unique in that respect. My mother is actually British, by the way, um, and my father is Russian by way of Yugoslavia. Um, and so I grew up with a real appreciation for American freedoms, particularly freedom of speech. I specialized in it in law school, um, which people thought was kind of weird. Um, and I went uh, and I got uh, started at FIRE in 2001, about a year after I, I, I graduated from law school. And FIRE defends free speech on college campuses. They actually, uh, Harvey Silverglade, like went out um, and found me in San Francisco at the time. And uh, so that meant I was kind of had a front and center seat for the culture war for, for years and years. And I don't think I need to tell anyone um, that it's exhausting. That, that essentially when you're in the middle of this stuff all the time, people are suspicious of you uh, from both sides of the spectrum. You get to see some of the worst aspects of human personality. Um, so it, it was kind of rough. And, and I only recently have been, you know, kind of emphasizing how much of a role being stuck in the middle of the culture war actually played in me getting depressed. But it was a big part because like even, you know, I had a bad breakup at the beginning of 2007, but that was probably in no small part due to the fact that, um, yeah, my girlfriend at the time didn't really like what I did for a living. You know, um, I, I mentioned this unlearning liberty. Um, and I, when, she, when I was talking about defending Republicans, I'm like, you know, cause I'm a, I'm a lifelong, uh, you know, center left Democrat. Um, you used to be, you know, but by the standards, I used to just be actually left, but whatever's happened today, I'd probably describe myself more as center left. Um, and she, I would, and since I, you know, come from this lineage of people who defend free speech, I remember saying to her at one point, it's like, listen, you know, honey, I would defend, uh, Nazis right to free speech. Of course I'm going to defend Republicans. And I actually got, uh, she actually responded, I think Republicans might be worse. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So, so the, and that, that was just one example of things that happened to me kind of like all the time. And also, you know, it's hard to start up an organization and I have sort of like a, a sense that you should, you know, have some amount of separation between you and the rest of the staff um, just to be professional. So I was just very lonely, um, very heartbroken. I was in a lot of pain. I have lots of old injuries and, and um, I would most years get at least a little bit depressed, you know, come winter time. Um, but it had been getting worse for a couple of winters, and oof, um, 2007 was brutal. Um, I, it got so bad. I was taking different medications, um, and eventually I was uh, hospitalized as a risk to myself. Um, you know, I, I called the called 911 while I was in the middle of, of trying to figure out how to kill myself. I'd actually done a trip to the hardware store to buy all the stuff that I needed to, you know, double foolproof uh, my, my intended idea um, for killing myself. And I was, you know, held for several days um, uh, up in Northern Philadelphia. Uh, and after that, you know, um, uh, and I always like to explain when you're in that kind of shape, cognitive behavioral therapy is, it, it's kind of too late for that. That's medication, that's get help, that's call, call a hotline, that's tell friends, that's that's panic time and, 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 and use everything else. But I started doing CBT as I was in, in my recovery, cognitive behavioral therapy. And CBT is all about kind of talking down the more exaggerated parts of your brain, you know, like catastrophizing, you know, thinking some, you know, um, if a, you know, employee was really mad at me that that would be the end of the world is catastrophizing. Um, and all while I was learning these habits um, that eventually meant that I wouldn't get these intense bouts of depression anymore because I learned how to talk back to the particularly um, hot, you know, voices in my head. Um, I was watching what was going on on campuses and being like, 
It almost seems like people are telling students that they should engage in catastrophizing or other cognitive distortions, as they're called, like all or nothing thinking. Um, and I mean, the overgeneralizing is like that's abs that's mandated virtually on campus these days. But back in 2007, students were pretty good on free speech. Um, and it was only when uh, we saw this very sharp change in 2013, 2014, where students um, started hitting American campuses who were demanding new speech codes, who were demanding um, you know, trigger warnings, demanding um, uh, microaggression policies, demanding that speakers be disinvited, sometimes conservatives, which didn't, people didn't bat that much of an eye out, unfortunately. But even liberals, when, when it got to, you know, people who were, who were considered liberal, they were like, hey, wait, wait, that's, that's kind of nutty. Um, and that's what, uh, and this observation that not only is this bad for free speech, but it's likely bad for their mental health as well. Um, well, partially that came to the fore because um, uh, students were saying uh, the, 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 what, the, the reason they were giving for, for um, this person not speaking on my campus and for the new speech code was that it would be psychologically harmful for them if, if they did. And I was like, no, that actually, that, that sounds all wrong. Um, it, it would be actually psychologically harmful if you thought you could be protected from this, um, it was kind of more, more of my thinking. Um, and I talked to this uh, about this idea to Jonathan Haidt. We wrote an article about it in 2015, and we fixed the whole problem. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. So you mentioned um, CBT. That's a joke, by the way. Just, oh, just, I, I just, know. Just, I really just, just, so, just so your <laughs> listeners know, it, it's a, a wild overstatement. Things were just about to get much, much worse. <laughs> I love it, man. So you mentioned CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, I'm I'm a huge fan of this tool. Could you mention to our audience, you know, what this sort of process of CBT looks like and how it helped? CBT is really, I, I think it, it, it's very popular. It's very, it's kind of like how I feel about. <laughs> this is going to sound funny. How I feel about Beyonce. Um, <laughs> pe people appreciate Beyonce, but they don't appreciate her enough. Same thing with like Missy Elliott or someone like that, where I'm kind of like, no, I know she's famous, but she should be famous her. Um, because CBT is very well known and it's very well studied. It's actually the most um, most studied intervention for anxiety and depression, period. Um, but one of the things that I find really profound about it is that if you look back to like, you know, ancient Greek thought about how rationality can make you more virtuous and can make you uh, happier and, and, and all these kind of things, um, you know, that there wasn't a lot of proof that that was actually true. And certainly when they've done studies about whether or not philosophy professors are more virtuous, they, 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 they oftentimes come out, no, actually they're, they can be just as dishonest as anybody else. Um, but CBT is really uh, not power of positive thinking. It's looking at your thoughts um, and trying to figure out what the voice in your head is saying. You know, I, I always give the example of kind of like being on a date, the date doesn't go well, and you go home and you tell yourself, I'm going to die alone. <laughs> um, which is a feeling that I think most people have had at some point, you know, of that kind of catastrophizing. And that's, and what you're supposed to do in CBT is you write down that initial uh, thought. You um, uh, circle or, or write how, how painful you find it. Um, and then you try to reframe it not, again, not through the power of positive thinking, but just rationally, just, just saying, am I, is this really definitive proof? I'm going to die alone. What, what actually happened here? And then you list the cognitive distortions. And, um, that includes things like mind reading is a cognitive distortion, assuming that you know where someone else is coming from. Um, catastrophizing again, of course, you know, like, um, is a uh, fortune telling the, the idea that you assume, you know, the future is considered to be a cognitive distortion. Um, and so you write down what distortion it is. And then after a couple tries, you reframe it and, you know, it comes down to something more like this date went as best I could tell this date went poorly, poorly. And I am sad, <laughs> which is bad, but it's nowhere near the, I'm going to die alone. And it was amazing. Uh, and the thing I really have to emphasize for people, and I tried to hit this as hard as I could in the um, in the book, is it's not an intellectual exercise that makes a difference. It's the habit that makes a difference. And that's why I have to do it over and over and over again. Because once, because it felt like, you know, for months, like I wasn't making all that much progress. And then suddenly I'd have these kind of catastrophizing voices pop up in my head. And, and it's like, you know, I was like, that's ridiculous. Like, go away. <laughs> like, they, they, they didn't seem true anymore, which was really kind of profound. And why I why I'm such a you know such an advocate for CBT? Well, there's lots of reasons, but not the least of which is that it is like the codification of the old philosopher's idea that rationality can help make you happy and virtuous. And also, if you look at the cognitive distortions, um, and this is the thing that I, I get really animated about, they're they're arguments for arguing fairly with yourself. And it's kind of amazing that learning how to argue fairly with yourself can make you less anxious and less depressed. 
But let's take it a step further. How about in arguments with, the, with each other? Because cognitive distortions have the virtue of actually being true. We avoid overgeneralization. We avoid catastrophizing. We avoid, uh, um, uh, what are the other ones? Fortune telling, uh, binary thinking that it either has to be a zero or one. And this list of rules, are, they're just good rules for life um, uh, in general. And that's one of the reasons why they, uh, that and free speech, you know, come uh, uh, kind of have overlap. Because if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to get speech banned, it usually goes something like, if we allow this speech, something horrible will happen. Um, and that's, to, you know, that's fortune telling, that's catastrophizing, all, all of this stuff. Uh, and meanwhile, in the U.S., un un unlike in Britain, we have, we make very strong distinctions between expression of opinion um, and actions. Um, and if you make if you have a very strong version of that, it's kind of like, well, listen, you know, like this is their opinion, and we think it's you know you might think it's a vile opinion, but we do draw a very strong distinction between um, when you say that or when you start start taking steps towards doing an action. Um, that 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 uh, that could be illegal, and that that very uh, clear distinction, I think, is one of the great innovations in human history. Um, that that essentially the idea that everyone's entitled to their opinion it goes against sort of everything in 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 our hearts to some degree. It's kind of like I I have to eliminate that guy. I have to punch that guy in the face. Um, no, actually, you know, in a in a decent democratic society, you know. You, you might want to leave them alone or you might want to argue with them or even more radically, you might want to listen to them, see if they have a point. <laughs> I love that point. I love that point. So before we delve into the uh, book, I just love to tie this sort of knot up on yeah. your 2007. Was there anything else besides CBT, which helped with your depression? Oh yeah. I'm, I am. I do try to be clear that, um, uh, Medications helped, uh, and and I want to be I want to be open about that. So so people sometimes people absolutely refuse to take medications, and I was so far you know I was so far gone I really needed it, but I will say that some medications made it worse. Um, I, I'm I'm one of, among the people who you know how they they used to say on, on ads for SSRIs it's like may cause suicidal ideation in children. Yeah, it's like yeah. I guess I'm a child. Um, <laughs> the the, the uh, um, SSRIs don't agree with me, and what was what was really interesting, um, and don't kids don't try this at home. Get the get the help of a real professional. Um, don't assume this is the rule. Is that I went from a uh, uh, like a, a a general doctor, my, my main doctor prescribing stuff, kind of you know loosey goosey, and then getting a, a real you know psychiatric professional who actually reduced everything I was on um, and said that maybe we're actually hitting this too hard, and the and the drugs are actually making it worse to a degree. So it was interesting to actually uh, be titrated down of all sorts of stuff, you know, um, in January and then doing the, uh, doing the CBT. Oh, one other thing made a big difference. Um, there's a reason why my head, my organization is headquartered in Philadelphia and I don't live there. Um, I, the city, it just doesn't agree with me. I feel very lonely in that town. And whenever I, uh, get back to New York City or Washington DC, I suddenly feel like myself again. So the lack of a support system, really important. Getting back to my friends and family in New York and in a town that I I like, and also a town that where it was easier to date made a big difference. Um, it, New York is notoriously easy for single men to, 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 to date. Philly, I was so uncool because I wasn't from there. And it was the first time I'd really run into the like, wait a second, I'm cool because I'm not from here. It's usually like every other place. It's like, oh, I just got here. I'm like a puppy. Uh, but Philly is not. It, it, I had I literally talked to people who said you have to give it five years before you feel like you live in Philly. I heard another person say that you have to give it seven years before you feel like you're a Philadelphian. And then I heard from a friend. It's like, oh, I, I was told 10. And I'm like, how many 10 years is do you people have? <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. So this book, The Codlin of the American Mind, I think I read Stephen Pinker saying that it's one of the books of the decade, which is... Uh, wow, thank know. you, Steve. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. He, 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 he's on our, our board of advisors. He, he's, a, he's, a very, he's, he, he's a great intellect, but he's also a very sweet man and, and, uh, and very funny. Yeah, he's, he's a fantastic. I'm a big fan of uh, Pinker's book. So I would love to know with this book yourself, you were a lawyer, Jonathan Haidt. He is a professor of social psychology. Yep. I love the combination of you two together. So how did you two, as you say, come together? And what was that writing process like with yourself and Haidt? Um, so we became friends uh, partially because I saw him on the Colbert Report. 
back when he was doing his um back when on on comedy central when he was still kind of like in his bill o'reilly type you know joke conservative <laughs> character and he had um jonathan Haidt on to talk about his book the righteous mind which is just a masterpiece it's absolutely brilliant i, I feel like i can't quite explain i'm not going to explain the whole thing but definitely your listeners should also run out and buy that um and it was interesting because he's like me someone who's more politically you know left of center um and after doing this research he's um he and he was actually probably further to my left too he um uh, started to get sort of some of the aspects of, of, of the way conservatives think. And actually, I'll give a very quick review. Uh, you know, father's Russian, uh, Russian Orthodox. You know, my mother is ethnically Irish, which means she's Catholic, but grew up in Britain, thinks of herself as British. So I'm, you know, I ended up pretty in touch with sort of old, school religions and old school um, norms in other parts of the world. And sometimes in the sort of, you know, the environment of a, of a fancy school with tons of rich kids like Stanford Law School, I, I was always aware of the fact that they were saying things that were really cruel. And that, that's, sorry, that's, that's an overgeneralization, that I ran into people who would, be, who, would, who would be really dismissive about, say, middle America and say sort of contemptuous things about them a lot of times for being religious and i remember being like what that's would you say that about croatia like 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 you don't know a lot about kansas like it, it kind of felt like a bigotry frankly um uh you, you know th that i was running into and what height observed was that a lot of the sort of moral foundations um that conservatives have are actually much more common in the rest of the world than uh, than American liberals, uh, American, I prefer to actually at this point, I prefer to say progressive, um, American progressives. Um, and that the, uh, the, the sort of like um, moral foundations of, of, of progressivism in the Western world are weird. Um, you know, uh, that, that essentially uh, we think that, that that's the way everybody thinks morally, which is basically uh, care for victims is extremely important and fairness is extremely important uh, without any of these other, uh, other moral foundations. So lo long way of saying. Um, he was basically saying, uh, saying that he came to understand conservatives uh, better, uh, you know, and partially how their points of view rep represent sort of the rest of the world. And, it w and, and I realized he's got this difficult position of being in the culture war as someone who's not actually a conservative, arguing, you know, and trying to, trying to uh, argue that people should play fair in the culture war. And I realized that's me, you know, like, like that's exactly where I am. Um, and there aren't that many of us, you know, certainly outside of my organization, there aren't that many of us. Um, and so I found out that uh, someone who had thrown a book party for my first book on learning liberty, uh, on learning liberty, that came out in 2012, had thrown a party for height. So I had him introduce us and we went out, had, uh, had a meal together, uh, really liked each other. We think very similarly in all sorts of ways. We come to very similar conclusions about uh, um, a lot of stuff. And we'd seen each other socially a bunch of times since then. But it was only our second lunch when I brought up this idea of sort of like the nexus between CBT and what's going on on campus. And I thought it was, you know, it was an idea I was working on, but I thought it was a little goofy. Um, and he loved it. And he wanted, he wanted to run with that idea. And we wrote, uh, it took us about a year to write um, uh, the Coddling American Mind article that came out in the Atlantic in, in August of, of 2015. And oh, you asked about the structure. Uh, generally, it ends up being that uh, you know, height, I have, I, I almost never want to say this because I have an agent and I want to sell future books, but I will <laughs> happily defer to the fact that when it comes to craft, height is a much better writer than me. Like he, 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 he can take paragraphs that I feel very clever for, you know, I said that in just a paragraph that he can like boil down to a line and, and it's really, really impressive. So a lot of it worked out with like me doing first drafts and me doing the research on that part. And then uh, John and um, adding on the other side and bringing in, in you know, a lot of his own schol uh, scholarly work. I definitely am highly deferential to, to him on, on, on prose. I have my, you know, I have my own prose style, but it's, it's probably uh, overly wordy, um, w w which one of the things working for him was, was trying to learn to be less wordy. I say in a very wordy way, of course. I love it, man. So in the book, you talk the three great untruths. What doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Always trust your feelings. And life is a battle between good and evil people. Could you delve into these three great untruths? Yeah, um, this came at one point we were getting so deep into the book um, and so deep into sort of the scholarship around it. I had to tell John that I felt like we were starting to write a book I wasn't interested in reading. Mm, yeah. <laughs> And I wanted to bring it back to what I felt like we did right in 2015. Um, and it, it kind of fell into 
uh, a habit that my my family has, which is we we give each other advice sometimes, but a lot of times we give each other negative advice. Not I'm you know my sister Alexandra, very Russian name, um, you know t- telling her you know Alex. Um, uh, I know you're really mad at that person. So you know what I think you should do? I think you should fixate on it. I think it should make your life's mission every morning. You know, like we, we, we give each other sort of sarcastic advice just to point out what not to do. Um, and we find it's actually surprisingly effective because one, it makes people laugh, but also it's really hard to be correct in telling people what to do. It's a little easier to tell people um, what not to do and you can get some agreement on that. And what I felt like we were doing at every level of society was um, giving, not necessarily every level of society, but giving a generation of students just bad advice. And so what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. That's the uh, great untruth of fragility. Um, This is telling students when they come in, um, and in my opinion, this is absolutely cruel thing to do to to, to students. By the way, maybe you or maybe someone you love or maybe that person over there is actually extremely psychologically fragile. And if they're exposed to ideas and you say the wrong thing, you or they might be damaged forever. And while that is, you know, that potentially could be true, for the most part, it isn't. Um, people recover, people, uh, people grow stronger, people come to realize, oh, wow, actually, you know, disagreeing was really painful at first, but now it's not so bad. Um, or watching scary movies went from being horrifying to being to, to being good. Um, so, the, but the myth of fragility uh, on campus is very strong, and the problem is it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that essentially, if you tell people that they're very fragile, um, they m- might internalize that and be f- be much more afraid, therefore making them more fragile. And the the most controversial part of this that actually now has the best um, the best research behind it um, is the inc- incredibly radioactive topic of trigger warnings. Um, and I say radioactive because the people who believe in this, and a lot of times these are very uh, good-hearted people, believe that trigger warnings are helpful to protect people with PTSD, um, uh, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, and that was the justification for trigger warnings. And uh, Oberlin, for example, the, the uh, uh, early on, tr- the administrators tried to uh, have uh, trigger warnings that applied to everything from material that included anything about racism, classism, politics. It was this list of like, how on earth are you even going to teach a literary class? So, and that was a good early victory in that the uh, faculty at, o- at Oberlin was like, no, this is not going to work. And because it even went so far as to say, avoid teaching these topics, which was like, okay, uh, maybe you're not ready for school then. Um, and so trigger warnings are, are, are really held as if they're sort of like a panacea. Uh, and uh, there's been, I think at this point, four different studies on them, um, confirming exactly what Height and I predicted was that uh, it actually tends to increase people's anxiety around things. And, and for very understandable reasons that, that, that essentially, um, that if you, pl- it's kind of like playing scary music before something, it's like, by the way, this is really gonna freak you out. And then of course, you know, you're like, I'm, well, I'm a little freaked out. Um, and so the studies overwhelmingly have found no benefit. Um, many of them, several, a couple of them have found uh, some increase of anxiety. Uh, and that includes uh, when they did, when one of the studies actually looked into people with PTSD, it, it was either neutral or uh, made it worse. So, and I, I, and when people come at, you know, come at us uh, or me, like when I'm at a, a campus and, they, and they're really upset about the trigger warning stuff, um, it's like, listen, I can be persuaded that these are helpful um, if it panned out in the research. And I've been, I was saying that back in 2015 too. Um, my guess is they're not uh, because, and, and, I, I would, and so like even the face one time of a crying student, which was really difficult. I'm like, listen, please understand what I'm saying. There's no evidence they're helpful. There's plenty of evidence um, uh, or there's plenty of reason to believe that they might actually be harmful. And that's just for the, in, for, for, for the individual. Um, and, but also what gets left out of that is that they put professors in a very difficult position um, to guess, and, and that has a chilling effect on, on academic freedom and on what students learn. And, and this has real world effects. The fact that um, professors at elite law schools hesitate to teach law relating to, to rape um, is who was who harmed the most by that? Uh, the great Harvard professor, Jeannie Sook, uh, wrote about this, was the first person to write about this um, back in 2015. But who, who's harmed by that when lawyers don't know more about sexual assault? Victims of sexual assault. So, I mean, the, so saying that part of the idea of being educated is being able to handle 
um, being exposed to horrifying things. You know, when you any lawyer, you have to take criminal law. Criminal law is grisly. It's all 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 get out. And uh, but you're not really trained as a lawyer unless you've unless you've studied it. Is the difficulty with this that at the heart of a lot of these progressive causes, there is a an element. There is a noble element to them, but they sort of work against each other. Yeah, it's it's one of those arguments that I made at the beginning of Unlearning Liberty um, is that generally people aren't motivated by evil or believe they're motivated by evil. They don't get up in the morning and say, in the name of evil, I will do the following 15 things. <laughs> um, and but at the same time, you know, there, there's a great quote. Um, you know, I, that's one of the reasons why I still call myself a liberal, because there, because there's an ideology connected to this that is very um, epistemically humble. You know, uh, there's a wonderful quote that I, that I try to quote all the time from um, uh, Justice. Uh, uh, he never was a justice. So that's right. A uh, great American jurist, um, uh, learned hand that says the real spirit of liberty is that which is not always sure it is right. And I say that on campus and people think I just like read a Zen cone. They're like, what, 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 what on earth does that, does that mean? But there's, there's, this, there's this humility that goes along with, you know, I might not know. Um, one of the things that I do think that, that can transform compassion into something that can be harmful is certainty. That essentially, uh, and, and a sort of religious fervor uh, behind it. And I think that currently, um, and particularly when you're training people to be activists as opposed to scholars, um, you know, as soon as you're protesting something, that's essentially saying that you're certain this is a that this is a bad thing. And I actually am very critical of higher education that it seems to convey ideological certainty on too many things that a real proper college should actually be conveying. Well, it's up to you. You, you, know, you know, make your own decisions. Study study this more before you make up your mind. All, all, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, generally, good intentions are generally the rule. Um, and therefore, like in math, they kind of cancel out. <laughs> what would you say to the person listening now that's, uh, that is thinking, yeah, I see the case for campuses. I see the blue head, you know, angry people running around taking control the of the campuses. The blue head. The, you know, what's the, that? Just students with blue hair. <laughs> oh, blue <hair's> great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the blue head. Uh, illiberal students running around taking control of their campuses, but they say, "Okay, it, this is just for campus. This isn't happening oh. in the real world." What well, do you say to that? That's just, that, that, I've always said this. That's just kidding yourself. Um, the idea, and and you know, to be fair, um, uh, well, actually, I don't know if I want to be fair. Um, I could understand how in a previous generation you could try to make the claim that students who go to Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard or Princeton or Stanford. Um, you know, they're just on an island off by themselves and who really cares. Um, but in society today, these are some of the most powerful and intellectual, uh, 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 powerful institutions in the world. Um, and that we defer to them on research. It's very good that we defer to a lot of these institutions, well, depending on the topic, but, uh, you know, on hard sciences research, you know, you can't really beat Caltech or MIT, for example. Um, but when it comes to uh, when it when it comes to other topics, you know, particularly the more politicized they are, the more um, uh, the more you have to be you have to wonder. It's like is is a group that doesn't have a single dissenting voice really going to be uh, ob objective on this? But we have deferred way too much influence in terms of hiring for the most prestigious jobs, particularly in the United States, to these. Um, very small fancy schools um that uh that's that's showing my my, my anti-classism coming out you know the fancy ones um <laughs> go going to going to the, these these um elite colleges and that they get going to elite college is one of the ways that you can kind of guarantee for your kids that they're going to stay in the uh what, what, what americans love to call the upper middle class but really we should be calling the upper economic class because you know it just goes up into the stratosphere in the united states how, how many times uh, more you make if you, if you're at that level um and if you have these institutions creating people who have these ideologies of course they're going to bring it to work with them and and we we've seen this over the summer you know with um uh with people at newspapers stepping down um, i mean we saw this in in just a matter of a couple months um james bennett the head of uh the new york times stepped down uh, uh, 
uh, uh, Barry Weiss, uh, who, who's a friend, and and both uh, and Barry very much citing kind of like this new ideology, mentioning coddling of the American mind in the process of, uh, yeah. process of it, um, and this kind of like uh, click of uh, of elite students who also at the New York Times had older people who you know kind of agreed with them or just wanted to look cool to them, um, which is an unfortunate dynamic that I've seen. Uh, but this happened at camp uh, all over the country, and then you had Glenn Greenwald, you know, step down for the Intercept that he co-founded, citing precisely this. You had uh, Matty Iglesias step down from Box, and he more hinted at this, but he definitely talked about si situations that were like this. Andrew Sullivan. Is basically like you know, to to do a degree, he's like the father of blogging. Like he, he he's one of, he at one point was one of the more influential voices in the country. He got kicked off of New York Mag, which is like kind of you know second middle tier. Um, and these are institutions that we rely on to make our to, to, to figure out the world the way it is. And so there's there, there's a guy that I, I argue with. I, I like him a lot, but he basically is like, no, no, no. What's the big deal? Want this one, you know, so what? A dozen people got fired, you know, maybe two dozen. And it's like, well, that we know of. You know, it was bad enough that 150 people wrote Harper's to say, like, listen, we have an environment that is very conformist. It, it, it's not pluralistic. It, it, it's actually very um, it's actually very intolerant. And when you when you look at it from the point of view of how many people were making some of these issues one of their main things, you know, Andrew Sullivan's right at the top of the list. He was writing about this all the time. And that's essentially what got rid of him. Uh, Glenn Greenwald was pissing off his um, uh, sorry. Uh, I don't know if it's a family show. Uh, his, <laughs> his, his, his staff for being an old school free speech guy. Um, that's really important when there's only a handful of dissenters and all of them lose their jobs. Um, uh, you have to wonder about what that says to people who aren't, you know, as famous as J.K. Rowling, for example, or that many of the people assign the Harper's list. So this is this is going into the quote unquote real world and it's having it's wreaking havoc. And people are come to me in height a lot and they say, listen, you can't I can't name the corporation, um, but we have this new generation of students and they are used to every conflict being intermediated uh, by uh, either a parent or an adult or some official in K through 12 or in higher education. And that means that every small interaction that's negative ends up going to human resources and human resources has become probably too powerful um, in, in the United States and um, and in fear of lawsuits that 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 gives these uh, for what would have been considered sort of junior members disproportionate power and and they know how to they know how to use power um, in that way because you get you get schooled in that in K through 12 and, and in higher education. So I, I think that we're seeing well, with some of these cancellations and, and with um, some of the backlash, um, we're seeing some of the uh, the downside of having um, uh, students sort of indoctrinated in these ideas about themselves um, hit, hitting the real world, and it's going to get worse. Yeah, and I mean, just this year alone in 2020, we've seen. J.K. Rowling's uh, publishers. We've seen walkouts because she published a book called The Ichabog. We've seen people try at Spotify trying to take uh, publishing control over Joe Rogan. We've seen yeah. Penguin Random House trying to, the staff there, uh, making a sort of slight to Jordan Peterson. But basically all of the dissenters. When you, when you think of like <laughs> the people who, um, and the funny thing is these are people who in a lot of cases quite specifically had to move off campus or already were off campus because otherwise on campus, they, these are, it's too hard um, to, to make these arguments. Now, Jordan Peterson, um, that was a particularly interesting case because um, apparently there, there were people crying at, at, at Penguin uh, Canada about when they found out that Jordan, they were gonna do a Jordan Peterson book. And meanwhile, you know, like I've read Jordan Peterson, like we don't have the same ideology. Like he, he definitely sees the world from a much more religious and much more kind of like, Fought like that life is horrifying um, in a way that, you know, partially because my dad's life was so horrifying, I, I tend to be like, well, you know, at least Nazis didn't burn on my village today it, it, it is one of the, like, it, the fact that I, I'm well aware of the 1930s and 40s, like always makes me like, well, you know, this isn't so bad. Um, but the, but the idea that the uh there would be people uh young people you know but, but professionals crying to make sure uh, to, to try to sort of indicate like we shouldn't be publishing this person i don't and i don't know if they really understand what they're doing to forgive this word epistemic institutions that the not the if the institutions that create knowledge are biased um and that includes higher education um that I think actually a lot of departments, a lot of individual scholars do a great job of putting their bias at one, at one side. But 
they are overwhelmingly tilted in, in one one political direction that undermines faith in them. Then when you have situations where you know, people are withdrawing studies and research papers um, because uh, conservatives, you know, use some of their data. That that's that that undermines trust. Then, when you add to that that other epistemic institutions like journalism, you know, uh, they can't tolerate the publication of a sitting senator who is giving the voice giving voice to the pretty scary opinions about. And this was a real stat: about 53% of the population thought that we should be sending the troops in during during the riots over over the summer. Horrifying to those of us who love civil liberties, but but at the same time, it's it's not saying that this is a good opinion to publish it. It's saying that you should know this, um, and and that's been that line's been blurred. And so bit by bit, I mean, having the American Psychiatric Association come out against uh, toxic masculinity, having professors, uh, sorry, having uh, groups of doctors actually say that Black Lives Matter protests, you should, you should be in masks, you should be indoored, indoors, but if you're attending a Black Lives Matter protest, that's somehow magically like not going to spread COVID. It, it's crazy stuff. Um, and, what, but it, but, and even though it's crazy stuff, it doesn't really get at why this is so poisonous. Because if you look at what's going on on the right right now, uh, and, there, and this has been the, the, the true um, of people on, on both extremes uh, for a long time, there's a tendency to believe in hoaxes and massive conspiracy theories and all this kind of stuff. A good um, way to counteract that are institutions that we all trust. And if conservatives are looking at this and like, they don't particularly trust higher education, and they've got, they have a point. Um, they don't particularly trust uh, journalism you know, uh, I think that some papers are, are better than others, of course, but, um, but you know, the, the more this happens, the more they have a point. And what's the result of having no, no epistemic institutions that people can trust? Um, greater belief in conspiracy theories, uh, more room for demag demagoguery, more, more room for superstition, more room for all of these things uh, that are also a threat to, to um, peace and tranquility in the United States. So I think, not just for these reasons, not for the reasons we talk about in coddling, um, but to uh, to a degree for these reasons, America is heading into a what's going to be a very difficult decade. Yeah, I was going to ask. I mean, you've sort of alluded to that these issues have sort of worsened since um, the oh, yeah. book come out. So I wonder where do you actually see this going? Where's the line? You know, where, where does this all end? I will I will practice some good epistemic humility and say I do not know what the line is and where, and and where this will end. I hope it's a blip. I hope that once um, there's a Democrat in the in office who wants to actually get things done, um, putting your ideas into practice has a has a disciplining effect. I, I said this very clearly in Unlearning Liberty um, that my most radical friends tend to be people who are guilt who feel guilty about making money at a fancy law firm and don't actually try to help people on, on, on individually on a daily basis. Some of my most um, sort of practical minded friends are ones who are like, uh, you know, for example, my friend who's a public defender, like he, he's, he's engaged with the real world all the time and he's trying to figure out incremental ways to, to, to improve things. I had a good friend who, um, uh, you know, worked in refugee camps, and her opinion was very kind of um, uh, very pragmatic. And so, a lot of the ideology, she would just kind of like be like, "No, no I'm trying to actually help people here." And so, a lot. So, if the Demo the Democrats uh, can su successfully argue, kind of like, "How do you how, how do you actually make people's lives better?" Um, that could actually tamp down some of the hot ideology. However, what we saw this summer, you know, like the, 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 the killing of George Floyd was absolutely horrifying. Um, and it united people around the country saying, oh, I can't believe this is happening again. Like, and this one's even worse. The, 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 the only one I can compare it to is probably Eric Garner, you know, um, which was also, we got to see the whole thing on tape. And me and an awful lot of other people were, were saying, okay, good. We all now agree on this. Uh, there are, here are the following five reforms we can do. Uh, we can, we can write our senators. We can, we can do these things to, um, uh, to help. And unfortunately the academic mindset, um, uh, particularly, uh, the way pr sort of like activist culture is taught is it's not very solutions oriented. It's guilt and shame oriented. So what ended up happening with this moment when we could have actually made some real progress it was kind of frittered away um by people getting canceled or or uh getting people uh, and this but and so at the foundation for individual rights and education I'm, I'm the president of of fire we've been around for 20 years we defend free speech on campus and due process and academic freedom um and we saw an 
utter explosion of cases during this time. Um, I, we, we normally get something like, yeah, we got something like four times as many cases as we normally do. Uh, and these are students and professors asking for, asking for help. Um, and it's amazing that this horrible tragedy ended up being the reason why, you know, someone ended up getting uh, their, disinvited from, uh, it, when they got accepted to university, and there were dozens of cases like this, uh, where, uh, you know, a fellow student or an activist would uh, write in saying, listen, I found this horrible thing on their Facebook uh, uh, message, or, and sometimes things like a, a, that should have been as personal as like on a thread among friends, and this person, you know, uh, should have their admission withdrawn. And amazingly, and a lot of times they, they, they were, and I can't see for the life of me what good this did towards, uh, uh, towards the goal of actually saving lives um, from police abuses. Mm. Yeah. Um, what was the reaction from other academics, from professors, from deans to the book? Did they agree? Did they point out that you were right or did they take um, sort of issues with it? Did they disagree? What was the reaction from other academics? Hmm. Depends on the academic. Um, it was generally been very well received. Um, when the original article came out, you know, John and I were like, we're taking on trigger warnings, you know, we're taking on all these, you know, sacred cows that um, compassionate people are supposed to believe in. So they're going to, you know, they're going to kind of come in to chop off our heads. And we were pleasantly surprised. You know, there are schools that teach coddling the American mind now. There are classes that that, um, uh, that do that. I know that there are circles, of course, that absolutely hate our guts. Um, and I think partially because they realize that we'd be kind of difficult to cancel because like the theory is essentially that you can only be canceled by your own tribe. Um, and John and I feel kind of a little bit outside, you know, it's like, you know, what, what, what are you going to do now? Although of course, height is in a more vulnerable position because he's actually still teaching. I, I occasionally like teach classes on first amendment law, but you know, Oh no, I'll have to give up my adjunct salary is like, <laughs> come on. Like, like, Oh no. Um, the, uh, it's just not that big of a threat with me. So I do think there are people out there who just absolutely despise it um, because they don't like uh, w what we're critiquing, but the arguments against it just so far, nobody's really laid a finger on it so far in terms of an, uh, terms of an argument. There, there was this amazing article by Maura Weigel um, in The Guardian where you know, people were passing this around it and t uh, on Twitter basically being like, oh, well, someone finally took on Haidt and Lukyanov. And you read it, and the one point she makes is that uh, student debt should have been a bigger issue in the book. Um, and I talk about debt all the time, so I was like, you know, that, that, I, I wanted to talk about it some more. But the reason why I didn't hit it harder was because Haidt being, you know, um, uh, very rigorous, showed me studies saying, well, listen, when they ask students about like how high debt rates on the things they're concerned about, it's shockingly low. And I, I couldn't really argue with that. I was shocked that that was true. But at, you have to remember a lot of cases at these at these fancy schools, these are rich kids like they're, they're not worried about they're not gonna, they're not actually going into debt, you know, so I but I, at the same time I thought that was a valid argument. The whole rest of it was guilt by association. It was the, 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 the biggest stretch was um, and they talk about Solzhenitsyn and you know who wrote the forward to the book about Solzhenitsyn. I don't. Okay. Gordon Peterson. Oh. And then it was like, Dana. <laughs> so we're like a couple of steps away from Kevin Bacon and therefore, uh, therefore Haram. Um, it was, it was, uh, it was pretty, it was, it just was, it was just a constant guilt by association argument. And something I want to write more about is that, you know, I have come, I am very much guilty of going to, uh, of going to school in the nineties and being very indoctrinated in the very primitive way of arguing, um, that elite colleges have, which is essentially, if I can figure out why I don't like you, I don't have to listen to you, which is not academic. That's not intellectual um, because jerks can be right and nice people can be wrong, as you'll see those sort of like time and time again throughout human history. And in this case, um, uh, it was it was basically if you could argue that someone was a conservative, you know, and you're like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to hear it, you know, like that that's that that was a soft way to completely dismiss having to learn anything about them. So people like Thomas Sowell, you know, Charles Murray, like these are all people that I I, I read surprisingly late in my life because they were they were they, they had like the patina of being you know, bad people um, that you'd be corrupted if, 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 if you learn from them. 
And I'm going to be writing more about, this is like the first level of what I call the perfect rhetorical fortress that we've created on campus. And it's almost taken for granted that you have to prove that you're not a conservative. And the thing is, they don't talk about this all that much. It's just kind of in the water. It's kind of like, and it taken for granted. As soon as you can figure out, as soon as you can label someone conservative, you let yourself off the hook for having to listen to them. That's ridiculous and that's the first level of the perfect rhetorical fortress um what the what the latest generation has done is take a lot of the stuff from identity politics and have so many identity qualifications that literally you can cancel 100 percent of the population just on that alone then you have the next step um which uh, and that identity one works pretty well in higher education um because they're very concerned about that kind of stuff um and uh, the fact that it actually can get you down to 0.01% of the population, you know, that's all the better uh, because it's thorough. The next level, which was played with a lot this summer, was finding anything bad, anything uh, unsympathetic that per the person's ever done or said, uh, whether you represent it kindly or not. Um, and that's really effective because it turns out most people have said something that might not be defensible at some point, particularly more in the public they are. And the final one is just this series of little cheap arguments that are that are considered to have serious weight. Uh, the one that I the one that I think has like the, the, the some of the the most holy resonance is um, victim blaming. Um, and mm -hmm. it sounds amazing to, to like so, uh, right now. I'm sure there are people going, oh, "What did he just say? He's saying that you should blame victims?" And I'm like, and and victim blaming ends up being this this idea that if you say something about a population or a group of people or a class. Um, and say, you know, actually, there are some things that they could be doing. Um, uh, there would be some cultural adaptations that would, you know, lead to less, uh, less violence, more productivity, all this kind of stuff. Anything like that, and this uh, is called victim blaming. And that sounds very nice because, like, no, no, it's not their, it's not their fault. Um, it is something that that, that seems very mor morally defensible. But when you think about it another way, what you're saying is, so you're saying this group of people are just objects being acted upon, and there's nothing they can do themselves for themselves. How is that not messed up? You know, like, and so there's also the idea of punching up, punching down, which is very much takes the point of view of of, of victim of victim blaming. Um, that, that essentially uh, it's okay to like uh, criticize or make jokes of the power that's above you, but never the people who are beneath you. All assuming, of course, this very complicated um, postmodern idea of everybody having inter-power relationships to each other, which, you know, there's ar arguably some truth to. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of like, you know, I think of Oscar Wilde, you know, drink is, uh, work is the, cur the curse of the drinking class. You know, b basically like his, his sharp thing to say, basically, you guys drink too much, you know, sharp, mean, maybe wrong, not necessarily. And, and it particularly hurts. It hurts. Uh, it particularly angers me is because I'm actually, you know, a first generation American. I, I was working class. I started working in restaurants when I was 11. And it's kind of like, why are you being so patronizing? You know, like saying that there's nothing we can do, like, like that we're just objects acted upon. And then, you know, you go read the, the forbidden knowledge uh, of Thomas Sowell and his, his heuristic is essentially um, as long in academia, as long as they get to stay forever on the side of the angels, um, as far as they're concerned, nothing, nothing else matters. They will shift uh, the, their view of the world just to maintain the fact that, well, as long as we're angels. I love it, man. So are there any solutions which you could give there? None. People, none. No solutions. To, We're doomed. To this <laughs> <laughs> um, there are. Um, uh, I'm not feeling super optimistic today, um, but there are. Uh, not the least of which is, well, here's the most radical one I'm coming around to. Um, we just need some institutions that people trust. We, we, we need, um, you know, and they, and they probably need to be new you know, like a, like a new organization that, um, that people can turn to, to figure out what's actually going on in the world. You know, um, America doesn't really have that when it comes to what campuses can do. Well, um, I don't know how much of the supplies in, in, in the UK, but here, you know, we're extremely dependent on, uh, on alumni dollars. Um, uh, a lot of these massive, incredibly expensive schools are, and there's, you know, I usually ask people to do five things, which is um, ask their uh, alma mater to 
stop violating the law, get rid of their speech codes that are unconstitutional, um, by, sometimes by state law, but oftentimes by the First Amendment if they're a public college. Um, stand up for your students and faculty fast. Do it fast before the, before the groups who want to um, uh, cancel them really uh, get, get a toehold. I've seen so many things fizzle on campus. If the university president says, nope, uh, right out of the gate, they tend to fizzle. Um, the other one is, you know, recommit and pre-commit to freedom of speech. Um, there's plenty of policies that have been passed that are very good on academic freedom going back to uh, 1915. Um, but the latest one that came out of the University of Chicago uh, brings up um, uh, sort of academic freedom for the age of, of speech codes. Um, and then the other two, uh, which, uh, and by the way, these are these first three are all things that a university president could just do on their own. And the next two, um, they could also do, there may be, may, may be a little bit more of an ask, but, but really crucial, orientation, um, that all schools should be teaching um, the philosophy behind free speech and, and inquiry, you know, the whole thing that academia is supposed to be about. They should be teaching it intensively um, when students first step foot on campus, and it should not be administrators teaching it, it should be scholars teaching it. Um, and that universities should uh, poll themselves to figure out if they have a problem. And we've been promoting all this stuff at FIRE and to the, ex uh, and to the, and to the extent we can do this stuff ourselves, we're doing it ourselves. Like we pressure universities to stand by their students. We uh, demand that schools drop their speech codes. We've been doing a speech code of the month, by the way, since 2006, and we're in no danger of running out of, uh, running out of <laughs> candidates. Uh, we created our own orientation to try to explain, uh, to sending to schools and be like, listen, if you're, you got no excuse, Excuse, we, we have one right here for you. And we even did the first of its kind poll of student attitudes on 55 college campuses um, to figure out, you know, let's ask the students themselves. Um, and what we found was that students, uh, no, no surprise, conservative students tended to be um, uh, more self-conscious about what they said and more afraid of, of, of expressing their point of view. More distressingly, that, uh, that students who are sort of self-identified as more far left were much too comfortable with uh, violence and and uh, destruction of property and that kind of stuff uh, to, to shut speech down and kind of no surprise to me for sure it, and it gets worse the fancier the school gets that, 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 that essentially like working class schools don't have as much of this whereas you know if you go to a brown like the the the, the romantic idea of tearing down someone's flyers or shouting someone down is is much stronger although brown actually plays pretty well um the, my my alma mater stanford placed surprisingly poorly which which was a bummer um so those are five things they can do the, the other thing that, that you can do is that we talk about in the book is gap years which i know a lot they do a lot of times in britain um i think the u.s could really use them and even if that means you you know it's a year of going out and partying you'll probably come back at least a little bit more mature and and, and that that helps uh, much better go work in another part of the country or go work in another part of the world that will that will make that will inoculate you a little bit more to some of this stuff and help you uh help you think for yourself and honestly if we if someone were to come up with a sort of national competition um for where where students uh like the best of the best students could rather than going to harvard um figure out have this really rigorous uh program that's intensive but you know more like an uh, treated more like a, a, a like a like a competition um i think that would start to scare and basically what i'm saying is competition for higher education um when they have a monopoly over your children's future who's going to stop them you know like when, when princeton has that much power over your children's future what are you going to do about it um but if there were if was if there was actually other options that were that, that were meaningful for these you know uh, oftentimes un, unusually bright kids um i think that any pressure any competitive pressure at all um, would at the top, there's competitive pressure towards, towards the middle and bottom. But if there was competitive pressure at the top, I bet universities would start to get their act together a lot quicker. Agree completely. Uh, I got one last question for you, which I ask every guest that comes on the show. It's called Spindrift, and I'm addicted to it. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. <laughs> and then I'll ask you to sign off and tell these guys any projects, any links, anything like that. But my last question for you today, Greg, is what makes a life worth living? What a great question. Um, I'm going to sound very uh, old fashioned with this, but when I, um, when I say this to my kids and I have a, I have a three and a five year old boy to just, just turn three and five. And I've, I'm very straightforward about this. Um, learn to love work and study and your life will be wonderful. <laughs>
and it took me and I always loved work. I always, I always took great satisfaction in work um, study. I grew up in an environment where, you know, there were a lot of people who being smart was kind of something you wanted to hide. And so I was a big drunk football player in high school, you know, like, um, you know, I, I didn't necessarily want people to know that I was also the captain of the quiz bowl team, you know, and it was only coming. I only really came out of the nerd closet in like, in like uh, college. Um, and you know how like sometimes your parents will say the only person you're cheating is you by not reading those books 100 percent. i feel like i've been playing catch up you know like in my adult life try, trying to read and it sounds so lame but once you get past that kind of once and unfortunately higher education and a lot of education instills this idea that it's drudgery stuff i was doing by the way on my own um like back in high school and grade school i was going to the library and reading about you know the, about world war ii and written looking at microfilms of, of the 1970s and all this kind of stuff but no i wasn't gonna I, I the most important thing is to show that you get grades easily not that you actually work towards it and boy did i uh boy did i miss out because like the world of ideas the world of knowledge the endless sea of things that that you can know in addition to things that you can't that's something to get excited about like that that's a wonderful beautiful thing that you, you know that that uh for some people it just it it hits you right in your heart and, and if i can instill those two values in my kids even though they sound so like amish or something it's a formula for a, a wonderful, satisfying, meaningful life. That was a beautiful answer, man. Tell these guys where they can connect with you. Um, I'm the president of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. Um, so that's at thefire.org. We didn't get it early enough just to be fire.org. Um, <laughs> but, but we were close. Um, I, I'm also, I, I write the, uh, my blog there is called The Eternally Radical Idea. Um, I publish articles pretty, um, uh, you know, every couple of months I have outside articles too. Uh, as far as things that we're doing right now, you know, I'm doing a series called Catching Up with Coddling where I try to update uh, the, the data that, that we had in coddling. I'm trying to sell height on, on doing another book, uh, which I can't believe I'm saying, uh, but I, I feel like uh, so much has happened that we pr probably need to. And we have a, a documentary called Mighty Ira, um, which you can find almost anywhere, uh, which uh, is about the life and times of the head of the American Civil Liberties Union um, from 1979, right after they defended the Nazis at Skokie up, up until 2001. And it's beautiful and inspiring, and it shows you a, a, way, a, a way of being in which free speech is part of your life life and that means you're willing to be friends with people across lines of difference that you're willing to argue with them and that you take a good and happy warrior spirit about it Greg, this has been such a pleasure thank you for writing such a fantastic book and for coming on the show it's been a real treat well thank you so much for having me this was fun